Good morning, everyone. Please stand as you're able and uh, read with me the call to worship. Out of the depths I call to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my cry. If you should count our sins, O Lord, no one could stand. But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning when the night is long. Let's remain standing and sing the hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing number 57 in your pew hymnals or on the screen for you, you uh, viewing at home. Thank you. Be seated. When we come before God, we realize that the one whose name we gather understands us better than we know ourselves. Even then, God surrounds us with mercy and compassion so that we are free to acknowledge the depth of our need. Let us join in the prayer of confession and renewal, followed by a time of silent prayer. Loving God, you sent Jesus Christ to us as a sign of your grace and care. He shared compassion with those who were lost or broken and offered health and hope to those who struggle. Open our eyes to the need of others around us. Remind us that you see each of your children and all of your children through the eyes of love. Help us to serve people as Jesus did with generosity in our hearts and confidence in your care. Amen. The mercy of God shown to us in Christ has no bounds, no limits, no end. There is nothing that we or anyone can do to separate us from God's love. Because of what Christ has done, we can live in the assurance of grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. another in the peace of Christ.
I want to welcome you all to worship this day as we gather together on what has turned out to be a, a bright, sunny, formerly foggy morning and enjoy the gift of this uh, warm summer morning together. Uh, those worshiping together for the first time, welcome to you. As we can be helpful, we look forward to doing so, and we are glad to share this time of thanksgiving and praise to our God. If you would uh, take a moment and share with us your names in the welcome pads at the back of the pew in front of you and pass those along to neighbors down the way, that would be very helpful. And I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Canada Day. Um, some of you may not know, but uh, the 1st of July uh, is the day in which uh, Canada marks its independence as a nation back to uh, 1867, when uh, they became what they call uh, a confederation or dominion of Canada. Um, at that time, Great Britain was looking to withdraw uh, its uh, relationship with colonies in a variety of places, and the fact that there had been a civil war in this country just before that, they were actually not keen with the possibility that um, they might uh, be drawn into any kind of conflict here. So uh, Canada was, was uh, generously given its independence as opposed to um, the way we went about it, which was, I recall, somewhat differently. Um, we also look forward to a happy celebration of the 4th of July this, this week and hope that your celebration is safe and happy, whether it involves uh, barbecues with uh, family or friends, um, an opportunity to give thanks for the courage and the conviction of those who laid the foundation for uh, our freedom and nation today. Uh, April is away. Um, she and Bob are in uh, France for a couple of weeks. Again, she is getting to be the uh, grandmother to her grandson, Vinny, um, the built-in uh, nanny, um, and uh, that's a high calling in her estimation, one of her favorite things to do. And I guess if you're going to be looking after your grandchild, you may as well be in Paris. So uh, that is a good thing. Uh, we're grateful to have John Nelson helping lead our prayers this morning. Um, John and Michelle, his wife, have been part of our church family for many years and active in a wide variety of areas. Their children, Jack and Georgia, now adults, grew up in the congregation and are now off on their own adventures. Uh, John uh, runs his own accounting practice here in the South Bay. Our liturgist this morning is John Fitzgerald. It's the John team on this side of the chancel uh, today. Um, John and Angela came to us a number of years ago with their sons, uh, Andrew and Anthony, and their daughter, Athena. Um, John served for a number of years as our church treasurer during the time when we were uh, building our new education facilities and during the darkest days of the COVID uh, pandemic. So he uh, really worked diligently and ably to help see us through uh, the challenges of those times. And um, he's the second member in a row of the finance committee to serve as a liturgist with us. So the finance committee, they can do more than one thing. Our beautiful flowers this morning are in celebration of the 64th wedding anniversary of Jack and Joyce Crump, and they are here to enjoy them too, but we are glad to celebrate with you, and happy anniversary, Jack and Joyce. What a, what a joyful thing. Thank you. Whether you are celebrating the Crumps anniversary, the 4th of July, or Canada Day, there are donuts out on the patio after the service. You can bring your own celebration to the donuts or just let the donuts be a celebration. Um, and uh, tonight, after third service, you are invited, if you would like, to stop by for taco night. All you can eat street tacos um, after the service and uh, the opportunity to be in fellowship with uh, your uh, other members of our church family. Um, because it's Donut Sunday and Taco Night, of course, it's also Blood Pressure Sunday. Um, Susan Markey, 
will be over in the church office building, uh, glad to be helpful with uh, blood pressure or other health-related questions that you may have. She will be glad to be with you there. And now I'd like to invite the children to gather here at the front. This morning I wanted to talk with you guys about interruptions. You know what interruptions are, right? Um, like you're trying to go somewhere or do something and, uh, and the phone rings um, uh, or somebody drops by your house when you're heading out and you, you can't go wh where you were planning to go or let's say a, 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 an alien spaceship lands on the front lawn and your plans for the hey, day… Hey, hey, hold on, John. Hey, hey, hey. A spaceship landing on the front lawn? What are you talking about, man? Uh, Chuck, I'm, I'm, trying to do the, I'm trying to do the children's sermon over here, if you wouldn't mind. Just, um, so, so we're talking about interruptions and, and how you're trying to do something good and helpful and, and trying to get a message across to somebody or do something for them. And then, yeah, but you're, you're talking about spaceships on the uh, front lawn, uh, it man. Was, Chuck, it was just an example. I, wasn't, I didn't really mean there was a spaceship. And, and, and it was just like, uh, hypothetically, what if a spaceship landed? It would be an interruption, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, hypothetically, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we know something about interruptions, don't we? I'm just trying to do the children's sermon, and then something else happens instead, and it's hard to get back on track. But that's what interruptions are like. And Jesus was interrupted in his work, too. When he was going places and doing things, other things happened along the way and sometimes even got in the way. Like one day he was going to uh, help someone whose daughter was sick. His, his uh, person had come to him and said, my daughter's sick even almost to the point of death. So it was very serious. And, and so Jesus went to go with him. But he couldn't go because there were such a crowd of people around Jesus who wanted to see him that they were pressing in, and it was hard to go anywhere. I don't know if you've ever been in a big, tight crowd like that, and you can't really see where you're going, and you can hardly move. And, and while he was trying to find his way to the, to the place where uh, Jairus' daughter was, somebody reached out and touched him. And it was a different kind of touch from just everybody in the crowd. This was a touch that said to him, somebody here needed healing. And he had felt in their touch that, that they had been healed by, uh, by grabbing his robe. And he said, who touched me? And the crowd was very close. And his disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. How can we say who's touching you? But the woman who had touched him she came forward and she said, it was I. And she also had been sick. She had been sick for as many years as the man's daughter had been alive. Twelve years she'd been sick. So she was desperate. And when Jesus came by, she felt that surely in him there was hope for her body. And so she reached out and she felt that she was healed by that touch. So Jesus commended her. He said, your faith has made you well. And he called her daughter, which is kind of a lovely word to use for someone that you've just met. And then he went on to the house where the little girl was still sick, except that where people from that house came to him and said, don't bother, she's already dead. Well, that wasn't what anybody wanted to hear and certainly not the little girl's father. But Jesus said to him, don't be afraid only believe, only trust. She is not dead. And when he got to the house, there were people who said, why waste your time? They were already crying about the child who died. But Jesus said, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And if you think about it, 
there were so many things that Jesus had to do to get to this place, things he had to overcome, and people who were in the way, the crowd, the woman in her touch, the disciples questioning him, now the people at the house saying, don't waste your time. Over and over again, Jesus had to sort of fight his way through to do something good for someone. And he didn't give up. And I think that story is, is good for us to know because sometimes when we're doing something good, when we're doing something helpful, we can also get interrupted. Things can get in the way and stop us from making the progress we want to make. And Jesus showed us, don't give up. Keep pressing on, and He will be with us. Let's pray together. God, like Jesus, we don't want anything to get in the way of doing Your work. Help us to know that when we are offering love and care, offering Your healing and Your compassion, that You are with us and you will see us through. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have fun at Sunday school.
Thank you, choir. That's uh, as beautiful the second time as it was the first. Thank you. Um, the Bible is filled with stories of people lifting up their voice in prayer. It's through prayer that we become closer to God. Uh, the lectionary today is, has an example of David lifting up a song of joy to his nation. Uh, please join me in offering up a prayer uh, today. Thank you, O Lord, for another day in our ordinary world. We gather to acknowledge your presence in our lives and the blessings you've bestowed upon us. You have great dominion over the past and the future, but you have given us dominion over the essential now. We pray that you give us the love and clarity of conviction to act in the moment to live our lives righteously and to spread your word. O oh God, let us not be another face in the crowd, but let us reach out to touch Jesus' cloak and express our faith, whether it be in helpful service to one another, in soothing the concerns of the afflicted, or in testifying to your glory, for such righteousness is eternal. Let us be resolute and without guilt in the joyful blessings you've given us in our ordinary worlds. Ordinary worlds often so different from those that we see on our phones. Let us be grateful for our ordinary relationships, our ordinary jobs, our ordinary daily routines, our ordinary congregation. Let our ordinary worlds be a reflection of our faith and that we might be unaffected by the ordinary, by the unordinary interruptions that manifest around us. Prevent us from getting caught up in it ourselves. Give us patience always to remember that you did not make death, but created all things to exist. And by your blessing, the regenerative forces of your creation are wholesome, and there is no destructive poison in them. It is new every morning, and even greater is your forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this Sunday before our nation's birthday for the regenerative forces of our republic to patiently take hold of events swirling around our ordinary worlds and to give direction to our future course as a nation. In God we trust, and you have always given our leaders inspiration to act in ways that have corrected courses and made us more reflective of your will for the multitudes. We ask that you lift up those who will pursue justice, peace, and programs that assist those who are in need while striking down those who worship greed, hate, and use terrorism to inflict their will. Bring them to justice as you've done. We pray for the afflicted and infirmed among our congregation and in our community, whose names have been given this morning, for your mercy is abundant and your love is everlasting. We pray for those recovering from surgery, Dave Penuer, Penuer Lindy Miller, Dan McLean, Ed Arn, and David Hessick. We hold up in prayer those who are in treatment for cancer, Sini Kale, mother of David Kale, Andy, Pine, Andy Penn, Art Schneider, Mary and Don Peterson. And we ask for strength for those with long-term care considerations. Dot McCrell, David Getz, Dick Getz, Rooney Renholt, Phyllis Sherwood, Tammy Kittiver, Bill Lotto, Andy Miller, Ron Jones, Arlene Korb, and Joan Green. We pray for the safety of our summer travels and ask for returns filled with renewed energy to pursue our ordinary lives again. Beyond our community, we pray for those stricken by flash floods, tornadoes, and wildfires, and those in the path of Hurricane Burrow. Protect them, soothe them, and give them hope through their closeness with you. 
Also, be with the people in the war-torn areas of the world seeking to return to their ordinary worlds or to, or to new possibilities that may become ordinary. May they find a life where they may live peacefully and abundantly. We pray for the migrants and the people without a home, for the addicted and the dysphoric, for those seeking equality, and for those who look upon themselves and don't see your presence inside them. We pray your grace might fall upon them all and save them, that you might strip them of their sackcloth and cloth and clothe them with joy. God, you've made the living needing of great energy to negotiate the new day. The time we have here is short. In the new week ahead, please give us the energy and prompt us into proper action when our ordinary worlds collide with unordinary needs that we might not waste the day, but be disciples of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Your gifts make possible the generous missions we seek to share with our world. Whether by check or transfer, here at the church, online, or in the mail, your generosity makes a difference. As we dedicate our offering this day, we lift up this prayer. We praise you, gracious God, for the life you share with us each day. We thank you for the gifts of community and family that help us to be whole. Bless the gifts we offer that they may bring healing and hope to our world. Amen.
please be seated. In this morning's gospel, Jesus crosses the back, back across the Sea of Galilee. He has spent time among the Gentiles and now returns to his own people. It seems he wants to be clear that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. He heals people from both sides of the deepest cultural divide of his day. And in both communities, he makes the point that there are always people who have been left out, even among their own people. He will share his gifts of healing and hope with them. Mark 5, verses 21 to 43 is our text for today. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell to his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather she grew worse. She heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhages stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, how can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing that she, what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Why does everything have to be so hard? Why is it so dang hard to get anything done, it seems, sometimes? You, you call the doctor's office to make an appointment for a family member, and yes, they can see them, in early August. You, you go online to pay your phone bill, but your password's expired. You need to create a new secure password because evidently there is a rash of people going around paying other people's phone bills. They need to make sure that I'm the one paying this bill and not somebody else in their generosity of spirit. Some years ago when we were preparing to uh, replace the buildings that had long served our children's ministry program, um, we, uh, we built this parking lot over here, and the reason we did so was that if you were going to 
uh, replace buildings that are uh, soon to exceed their sell-by date, which those were, you need a place to put the children who are currently in those programs. We had 150 children every day in our preschool, and you can't just build them new buildings without putting them somewhere else for the year. And we looked all over. We looked at renting other facilities and other properties, and we just kept coming back to we wanted to keep it here if we possibly could. And so we, we created this parking lot. There was something over there before, but it wasn't very good. And, and the goal in the long run was we would have parking. But the real reason we did it was that we had to have a place where we could put portable classrooms. And so during the year of construction, we installed three portable classrooms over there. I made some other changes. The choir room gave up the choir room. It became a classroom. Aldersgate became a classroom. We did all kinds of funny things to make that work. But when we... Um, we're putting the portables up, um, it turns out that the, the city and the county are eager to make sure that um, portable classrooms aren't all that portable. That is, um, they required us to achieve um, an installation that would have worked if they were permanent classroom buildings, if they were going to be there till the end of time. There was no accommodation for something that was only going to be there short time. So each building had to be uh, seismically anchored to the earth um, uh, with uh, rods that were driven deep into the ground and each one tied in. Uh, we had to have alarm systems and communication systems installed as though those were going to be there forever. We had to build uh, decks and ramps because of accessibility needs um, and because we're in a high fire zone, we had to build those decks and ramps out of fireproof lumber. Now, I did not know there was such a thing as fireproof lumber until we went to build uh, those decks. And it turns out that there is such a product, and you can get it in California, but you have to get it from out of state because the chemicals used to make lumber fireproof are illegal to use in California. So you can poison people in Arizona and Nevada, let them bear the brunt of that, and then you can buy the, the fireproof lumber afterwards. Um, and so we did. Because the county knows that this is a high fire zone and because there had been fires in California that had been disastrous, one of the things they looked at requiring us to do was to put a second layer of sheetrock, of, of interior walls on every classroom in those portables in order to protect the children from fire. Now, those were all, I would say, legitimate and valid concerns unless you factored in the condition of the buildings that we were looking to replace, which were seismically dubious. They had been built in a different time. Um, their uh, infrastructure, uh, electrical, heating, all of those kinds of things, not, not that new and not that good. The roofs, the roofs did not have asbestos in the tile. The roofs were asbestos. They had other things in it to hold the asbestos together. We just thought, this is probably, this is not a building that has a long future here. It needs to go away. And from a fire safety standpoint, the buildings were covered with redwood shingles and they were surrounded with plants that were grown right up to the buildings, exactly the kind of scenario that you don't want to have in a fire. So in order to, to accomplish what they were doing, they were actually making us take longer in the hazardous buildings that we were looking to get rid of. I cannot remember how many times we were back and forth to the Lamita uh, planning office where those decisions get made uh, over the counter. Um, but we made at least three different trips with cashier's checks for the permit that we had been told what the permit was going to cost. And we had, had to be a cashier's check for that amount. And we got there and it was a different amount they told us when we got to the counter. So this check wasn't going to work and we would have to go back and get a new check for a new amount. And there were some other things they wanted to do as well. On the third trip, we came with the new check and the new amount, which we had confirmed was correct. 
And the person at the counter said, that's not the right amount. I don't know who gave you that number. And it's like, well, the, the woman at that other desk is the one who gave us that number. But we couldn't say that because if we did, we knew with confidence that anything else we did would be slow walked through the planning office from that point on. So uh, we had uh, a check with the wrong number, but in this one occasion, the check was within $20 of the right number. And we had a 20 on us. So we wanted to give them the 20, and they said, we can't make change. I didn't, I didn't even want change. I was just like, just take the 20. They couldn't do that either. Luckily, the snack bar was open, so we could go over and buy a carton of chocolate milk so that we could give them the cashier's check and the additional, I don't know, $16.37 that would be required to make up the number that they assured us was correct. When I came home that day, came back to the church, parked in the lot and, and walked back to the office, I remember thinking to myself, you know what would be easier would to be to do nothing, <laughs> nothing at all, leave the old buildings that are getting more and more hazardous and just, just not try to do anything because if you try to do anything, it's just so much trouble. Why should it be so hard to do something good and generous and righteous and helpful to children in our community? Why, why would that why would people get in the way of that? Why would we have to overcome so many obstacles to achieve something that is obviously the right thing to do? I wonder if Jesus felt like that some days. He goes to the synagogue. There's, there's somebody there who's struggling with what appears to be possession by a demon, Jesus casts out the demon and heals the man. And people say, you know, it's really the wrong day of the week to be doing that. On the Sabbath, we don't really heal around here. Resistance, opposition. So not long after that, he and the disciples, as we heard last Sunday, get in a boat and sail across the Sea of Galilee. On the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that's where the Gentiles were. And there were people in his own community who would have said, what's he going over there for? Is Jesus some kind of Gentile lover? What's the deal? Charity begins at home. Is everybody in, in Galilee already been cured of whatever ails them? Why be going over to those people? Of course, in Gentile territory, it doesn't go all that easily either. There were obstacles to overcome there. In fact, he, he healed a man who had been tormented, tormented, was living out in, in the cemetery and was tied up in chains at times to stop him from hurting himself. Jesus healed him, and that healing caused a lot of trouble. Not for the man. He was grateful. He had sort of come back to his uh, right self. But the people in the land of the Gerasenes said to Jesus, you get out of here. Why don't you go back to where you came from? So they did. And our story today includes Jesus uh, being back in Galilee. And, and Jairus, who is a leader of the synagogue, the very same synagogue where people had objected to his healing before, now a leader of that synagogue comes to Jesus and says, my daughter is sick to the point of death, but I know that you can heal her. So Jesus goes. The fact that the synagogue had been opposed to him earlier on, that doesn't, that doesn't matter at all. He's just going to go, or he would go, except that there is such a crowd pressing in on him that they can hardly make their way. They're fighting their way through the crowd, twisting and turning, and Jairus knows where he's going, and Jesus is trying to keep up with him. And in the midst of this crowd, Jesus feels someone touches him. And he, he turns to the crowd and says, who touched me? And nobody says anything, and the disciples say, everybody's touching you. How, could you. how can you ask who's touching me in this crowd? 
But this touch felt different. This wasn't the touch of the crowd pressing in. This was the touch of desperation of someone who had been struggling and suffering for as many years as Jairus' daughter had been alive. The woman uh, identifies herself. She had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And, and because uh, blood was seen as uh, powerful, uh, uh, sacred, uh, uh, it, it was uh, understood to be uh, life itself in the blood. If, if someone was bleeding, um, that made them ritually unclean. And, and someone who was ritually unclean, if they were in touch with somebody else, that passed the ritual uncleanness on to the next person. And so, people tended to avoid being around people who were unclean. They sometimes uh, sequestered themselves if it was temporary or, in the case of this woman, for 12 years that she would have been separated from family and dear friends, uh, unable to get well. And uh, again, she saw lots of doctors, it says, lots of physicians. But, you know, again, physicians in the first century weren't exactly board certified. They were doctors of a sort. And she didn't get better, but worse. So as Jesus is sort of fighting his way to get to the daughter of Jairus, as he's overcoming those struggles, imagine what she has had to overcome to get to that place that day, and that that she would reach out in, in, in desperation and in hope to touch Jesus' robe as, as he goes by. And as she touched it, she felt that she was well. And Jesus, who had again been stopped, interrupted along the way, could have, could have chastised her, could have said, I'm on, you know, take a number, get in line, wait with everybody else. Instead, he calls her daughter, which is a, a fairly intimate word to use for someone you have just met. He calls her a member of the family, and he commends her saying, your faith has made you well. He does not say, my power has made you well. Your faith, your trust has brought you health. So now he and Jairus and the disciples continue on, or again they would, but people have come from the house to tell Jairus that it's too late. His daughter is gone. There's no point in doing anything further. She has died. But Jesus hears them tell Jairus this this message, and he says to Jairus, she is not dead. Do not be afraid. Only believe. And when they come to the house, he finds a, a first century wake unfolding with weeping and wailing and People say again, why bother? It's too late. She's, she's dead. And Jesus says, she's not dead. She is only sleeping. And, and Mark says, they laughed at him. Now, sometimes laughter happens in a situation because we're overwhelmed, and we don't really know what to do or how to handle it. And, and so, we laugh at the impossibility or the ridiculousness of the situation. And sometimes laughter is mocking. Um, people don't believe and are, are, are making fun of something someone is saying. I, I don't think, the text doesn't say what kind of laughter it was, but it doesn't sound like it was joyous laughter. It doesn't sound like it was the laughter of relief that at last someone has come who can do something. Because it says that they laughed at him. That is, that is not joyous. So, Jesus has had to overcome all kinds of obstacles and so much resistance in getting to this place. The opposition of people in the synagogue, of people in the land of the Gerasenes, people back in his own home country, the pressing of the crowd, the interruption of the woman, and now the objection of people in the house. Why does it have to be so hard to do anything good, to do something 
righteous and true and healing and hopeful to, to engage in, in uh, a holy act to bring the grace of God to someone who is struggling. So he takes just a couple of the disciples with him and goes upstairs, takes the little girl by the hand and, and says to her in Aramaic, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And so she does. And then he tells the people in the house not to make a big deal of this, but to get her something to eat. It shouldn't be so hard to do, to do good things. The, the, the people at the planning department, they were not trying to drive me crazy. I kept saying that to myself, these people are not trying to drive you crazy. They were doing it, but they weren't trying to. They were, they were focusing on the things that they are required to do without any mind to the effect that that would have on an important project. And it, again, we weren't trying to put up a strip club. We were trying to put up portable classrooms for preschool age children whom we hoped to keep safe in the long term. But they couldn't see that. Um, you could call it uh, inertia, sort of an institutional mindset. Those are Frequently, that's what's happening when, when things get in the way of what we want and hope to do. Even when we are frustrated, the people on the other side of that may not be intending us harm. But some of the opposition that Jesus faced um, was, was meaner than that. Uh, like when He went over to the land of the Gentiles and people wondered, why is He going over there? Sometimes uh, when, when we see somebody else getting something that we think is rightfully ours, uh, resentment uh, arises. Um, we object. Uh, we're, we're not so sure that those people, they're, they're kind of undeserving of this. Why are they getting theirs? Harold Kushner, a number of years ago, wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People, which is a wonderful reflection on uh, suffering um, that is unjust and unwarranted um, when people who are uh, living well and doing right end up uh, experiencing things that just seem so unfair to them. It's a, it's a wonderful read. I commend it to you. But he reflected in the years uh, after the book's publication, he got lots of letters from people appreciating it, but he got letters from some people who said that their theological problem was not when bad things happen to good people, but rather when good things happen to bad people. That's what drove them crazy. So why should it be so hard for us to do the right thing? Why, why face so many obstacles when we are trying to make a, a positive difference in the world? Why does it come to that? But it does come to that. The people who set about the project of uh, building a free and independent nation, some 200 and Plus, years ago, that wasn't easy for them either. They faced all kinds of resistance and objections and opposition, even from among people that they had counted on being with them. That was, that was a, 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 an arduous and a, and a terrible process uh, to, to set uh, the nation into a, an independent future. And, and the people who uh, sang the wonderful anthem our choir brought to us uh, in the early years of the civil rights movement, they also understood that, that that is a long journey. It doesn't say we have overcome, it says we shall overcome one day. And that song has a, a, a rich uh, history. It, 
uh, is attributed, uh, was copyrighted by Pete Seeger, who never claimed to write it, but who added some of the verses. Um, he had learned it from someone who had learned it at a gathering of uh, tobacco pickers uh, who were meeting in 1946 to contemplate whether or not to strike to gain higher wages for their work. And, and as far as we know, they were the first ones to sing, We Shall Overcome. But it became a, a vital um, chorus of the civil rights movement and of many movements since then of, of people uh, seeking freedom and hope and dignity for their lives. It goes back to an earlier uh, work, um, some tie it to a woman named Louise Shropshire, who um, wrote a piece called If My Master Wills, in which the line, uh, I will overcome, uh, appears. Um, but it may go back even farther to that, to uh, an African-American African pastor named Charles A. Tindley in about 1900, wrote a song called I Shall Overcome, uh, the opening verse is, uh, the world is one great battlefield with forces all arrayed. If in my heart I do not yield, I shall overcome someday. I shall overcome someday. I shall overcome someday. If in my heart I do not yield, I shall overcome someday. It should be easier to pay your phone bill than it is sometimes. It should be possible to make a, an appointment with the doctor in the near future. But Jesus helps us to see in his own life and ministry that the life of faith will require patience and persistence to see it through. But we have his example and we have his confidence that in his love we shall overcome. We shall overcome. Amen. Our hymn of celebration, In Christ There Is No East or West, honors the grace of God which reaches across boundaries and borders to welcome and include all. Let us stand and sing together the words printed in your program or for those at home appearing on your screens. Christ, the love of God, the healing and hope of the Holy Spirit, to be with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>